the last video, we were considering the pressure in large stationary bodies of water. In this video, we're going to be considering what happens when the water starts to move, as it does in a river. So we're going to be considering fluid flows. We're going to start by considering ideal fluid flow, and then we'll look at some turbulence and viscosity, which is less ideal fluid flow, but happens in real life. So first of all, let's define what we mean by ideal fluid flow, and then we'll look at a couple of equations that describe ideal fluid flow. So ideal fluid flow is the flow of fluids which is steady or laminar. So a steady flow means that each of the little increments through that flow is moving with the same speed or velocity. So it doesn't matter if you're at the top of the fluid or you're at the bottom of the fluid or where you are in the river. If it's ideal fluid flow, you've got the same speed at each of those points. And this is also called laminar flow. The second thing we need to have ideal fluid flow is irritational flow. So this means that if we put a paddle wheel at any point in that flow, it doesn't spin. So the force on the right of the paddle wheel is the same as the force on the left of the paddle wheel. So whirlpools and things like that would mean that we had non-irritational flow. And so we're assuming that we don't have whirlpools and things in our ideal fluid flow. The other thing we need for ideal fluid flow is a non-viscous liquid. So water is fairly non-viscous. It's not very sticky, it flows quite fast, and so this is non-viscous. Later, we'll be looking in more details about what viscous is. Honey is a very viscous fluid, for example. And finally, the fluid that we're considering needs to be incompressible. So if we try and squash water, it's really, really hard. It's very hard to change the volume of the water by applying pressure. Air, on the other hand, is easy to compress, and so air is not incompressible. So we're going to make those assumptions about our ideal fluid. So let's start by considering water moving along a hose. Now, what do we know about water moving along a hose? Well, one thing we know is that any water we put in at this end has to come out at this end eventually. So the water we put in here each minute comes out here each minute. If that didn't happen, we'd have a big buildup of water in the hose or we'd have extra water coming out the end so we'd be magically creating water somehow in the hose and that doesn't happen. So we know that the volume in per unit time is equal to the volume out per unit time. Now imagine what would happen to our hose if we had a really wide end here and a narrow end down here. Would it still be true that the volume we put in in one minute here comes out in one minute there? Well, yes, it would be because otherwise, once again, we'd be creating or destroying water within our hose and as the hose doesn't have magical properties, that couldn't happen. So this actually leads us to an equation to describe fluid flow. We've got the volume in per unit time is equal to the volume out per unit time. Now the volume flowing through a piece of pipe is equal to the length of the pipe times the surface area of the pipe. That's just a mathematical equation for the volume of a prism. So if we have that volume flowing in that unit time, we can write the surface area times the length of the pipe on time has to be constant because the volume in is the same as the volume out. So we can write this as the surface area times the length over the time is constant. Now the length that that water flows through over the time is actually just the speed of the water through the pipe. Because speed is just the distance travelled over the time. So we're going to give that the symbol V B for speed because speed is very similar to velocity. So we're going to give that speed the symbol V. So the length travelled over the time is equal to V. 
And so we can write our equation as the surface area times the velocity is constant. So this gives us the equation A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2. So the surface area... So if we have a wide end of the pipe, then this has a very large surface area and a narrow end of the pipe has a very small cross-sectional surface area and so the velocity must be much greater through the narrow pipe than through the wide pipe. So if you're cleaning your car and you want to get water coming out of the hose with a high speed, then you tend to put your finger over the nozzle of the hose and block off some of that cross-sectional surface area of your hose. And so when you do that, decreases the cross-sectional area and increases the speed of the water coming out, which means that it can hit the car with a lot more force. When it, when it stops, it has a lot more force and that helps to dislodge the dirt from your car. Let's solve a problem using this equation now. 7,600 gigalitres per year needs to flow through the Murray-Darling system to maintain its health. At one point along its path, the Murray has a width of 20 metres and a depth of 5 metres. We're going to assume that all the water in the system flows through this point. What average speed is needed at this point? And what speed is needed in a floodplain with a cross-sectional area of 1,000 metres squared? Okay, so we know that the volume over the time which is needed is we've got 7,600 gigalitres. So that's 7,600 times 10 to the 9 litres. And we want to get this into SI units. So we'll convert it into metres cubed. So if we times it by 10 to the minus 3, that gets us from litres to metres cubed and then we need per unit time. At the moment this is per year. So in a year there's 365 days, in a day there is 24 hours, in an hour there's 60 minutes and then in a minute there's 60 seconds. So this is going to give us the flow rate in metres cubed per second. So entering this into the calculator, we get 241 meters cubed per second is the flow rate. So we know that this flow rate is constant because we've got A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2. And this flow rate AV is just equal to the volume of the water over the time. And so we know that at this point it's got a width of 20 metres and a depth of 5 metres. So there's 20 metres, here's 5 metres. So the cross-sectional area A is equal to 20 times 5 and so that's equal to 100 metres squared. And so we can get the speed, we've got AV is equal to 241 and A is 100 times the speed and so the speed is equal to 2.41 and that's in metres per second. So that is a fairly fast speed for a river to flow as we would expect if all the, riv all the water in the Murray-Darling was concentrated into such a small area. So then it asks us how fast would it flow if it went into a floodplain with an area of 1,000 metres squared so that would be a very small flood plane. So that's just the cross-sectional area that could be, say, a kilometre wide and a metre deep. Is one possible configuration. But in that case, we just use again AV, the cross-sectional area times the speed is equal to 241. But in this case, A is 1,000. So we've got 241 is equal to 1,000 times v and so the speed in this case is equal to 0 0.241 meters per second so much slower flowing which is why rivers slow down when they come to a floodplain